Hello, everyone. This is Kathleen Byers, founder of Corporate Women Unleashed. Happy to be here for today's broadcast, where we're going to be talking about why typical workplace, um, you know, work-life balance um, strategies fail, okay, in the corporate world. Um, now, Corporate Women Unleashed, what we do is we work with high-achieving women, corporate executives, and we really show them how to create really effective life balance, okay, where you feel in control of your career, you're navigating it effectively, but most of all, you're understanding how to create balance and flow in your life so that you don't have to step back from your career to enjoy this amazing life that you have, right? So what I want to talk today is about how typical work-life balance strategies fail and what we see over and over and over again, and my husband and I did this for years until we sorted this out for ourselves, was we looked for things external to us that could help us create greater balance. Now, in some ways, there's nothing wrong with that on the surface level, right? There's nothing wrong with saying, I'm going to hire a nanny or I'm going to hire an extra hair of uh, um, you know, helping hands on the weekend or I'm going to send the dry cleaning out. All those things are great. But when it specifically comes to controlling your workload, what happens is we see people say, you know, in our minds, we're, we're trying to tell ourselves, let me just get ahead. If I could just take a month off, if I could just get through this next project, if I could just build up my team, if I had a better boss. And so what's happening is over and over again, you know, if I just knew how to work more efficiently, if I could make decisions faster, like all these things that we just keep thinking, if this stuff could, could just be better, we could finally wrangle the monster called, how do I live my life and still have this big, bold career? Okay. So uh, my husband, whose name is Scott, we tried this over and over and over again in our own life. And we would say, you know what, this weekend, let's just take this weekend off. We just need a break. Let's just step back. No more chores, no more errands. Let's just go out for the weekend. And we'd do it and we'd feel great. And it would last for a couple of weeks and then we'd be right back in the grind. Let's shut our cell phones off. Let's, um, let's go on a health, health kick. You know, we were always trying to diet or find something that worked. And what was happening, and I don't know if this happens for you all as well, but as we're trying to create this wellness in our life, it feels like it's two step forward, one step back. You're just in this boat rocking and you're just going back and forth and back and forth. Or, you know, some women will describe it and they'll say, Kate, I feel like I'm on a treadmill or a hamster wheel or a gerbil wheel. And I'm just running and running and running. I'm not really going anywhere. Like I'm changing the ingredients inside, you know, the, the, the gerbil wheel, like, but it's not really making anything really effective in my life. And life is starting to feel hollow. Life is starting to feel gray. It just feels like, wow, I have all these beautiful pieces around me, great family, great house, great job, great income, whatever it is, but it doesn't really feel alive. I can't enjoy it. You know, I'm just always working. I'm always on, I'm always mentally exhausted. <clears throat> okay, so what we really wanna stop focusing on is the external stuff and start looking at the internal stuff. And this is why everything you'll hear me talk about is always going to come back to human biology, psychology, the, the science of human behavior. Because what I discovered um, and my husband discovered quite by accident originally, and then with more intention to, to dial it in, is that no matter what we did, we, we were still kind of unhappy, like not morosely unhappy, like, you know, but just kind of not really joyful. And it seemed like you know, we, we had to be doing something wrong. So the first step we took, which was a big doozy, is we, you know, we, we quit the executive world, we quit the corporate environment, and we moved to an island. Wow, and living an island, how amazing is that? But what I noticed very quickly was now I was stressed out about living on an island. <laughs> how stressful could that be? Because we actually went to work for some dear friends, and we um, were employed as dive instructors, and we had to drive a boat. I didn't know how to drive a boat. I didn't even know how to swim. Good Lord. I don't know what I was doing, but it sounded like it was going to be this romantic adventure. And what happened was I started learning that here I was trying to drive this dive boat and the same problems I had in the corporate world had followed me there because what was happening is I was constantly worried about, am I driving the boat correctly? Am I going to crash? Am I going to kill someone? Am I going to stop on the mooring ball and know how to tie it up? Am I going to, you know, run into a fishing net? Like all this stuff, like the junk in my head had followed me from one environment to the other. And that was my first clue that maybe well-being and balance had more to do with just like the next best toaster oven in my kitchen, right? So I was like, okay, well, here I'm on an island and I'm crying myself to sleep at night. I'm nervous about going to work, my new work every day, which is like basically donning a bathing suit and taking people like swimming in the ocean. 
how hard can this be? The next step that I took um, after doing that for about a year, but, but here's the thing about living in the islands is I noticed that after the year was up, the first year we were there was I started feeling better because what? I'd gotten better at my job. I knew how to drive the boat. I wasn't worried about killing someone. So I started to have more ease and peace of mind. But then of course, being a high achiever and someone who's wired to do great things, we never stop at that, do we? Because the minute we just get to that comfort zone, boom, we're off and going to the next level. So, which of course then impacts us because whether I was in the corporate environment stressed out about my work and my workload and my boss and my deadlines and the greatness of the work I did, or I was living on an island worried about killing someone in a dive boat that I didn't know how to you know, drive, um, I was bringing that home with me, right? So you have the stress in your work environment and then you come home and your husband is like, hey, let's go out to dinner. And you're like, ah, you know, or he's like, you know, let's, um, let's do the horizontal mambo. And you're like, I'm too tired. And you know, you're just like not enjoying the beauty of life. He's like, let's sit on the patio and watch the lizards. Nah, I, I can't drive a dive boat. And I'm like inside curled up in the fetal position on my couch, not enjoying this incredible island life. Same thing I was doing back in my corporate existence, right? So then fast forward a little bit, we move on to the next environment. Um, which is we, we were divers, right? And so we were doing this whole like dive odyssey and we were technical divers, which means we dive in caves. So let's not take a tangent on cave diving. Yes, that's what we used to do. My husband had a cave diving um, business for quite some time. But what I was noticing is that women, very few women were cave divers back when I first started doing this in the early 2000s. But as women came in, if they were, especially the high achieving women, the lawyers, the doctors, the, 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 the corporate execs like myself, if this was very hard to adapt to this cave diving environment because you are thrown into it. You have to have a very strong mental game. There's a lot of skills to be earned very quickly, obviously with a very big price to pay if you don't. And the training process, I was watching this, this handful of women who were like me, you know, designed like me, same DNA, DNA, high achieving. They would come in to do this cave diving and they would fail like we all did in the beginning because you're, you're learning this whole new skill set and this environment that's terrifying. And they would get out of the water and they'd start crying and they would start shaking and they would say, I don't want to go ever do that again. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. This looks really familiar. Cause I did the same thing. My husband's like, what's the big deal? So you go in the cave, you didn't do it perfectly. You learn from it. You come out, you're alive. It's fine. No big deal. Right. And I was like, no, I don't ever want to go in this environment again. And here I was in tears again. And like the fact that the man is still married to me is like amazing because he's followed crying Kate, you know, big, bold, brave crying Kate through several different iterations of learning this internal rewiring process. So what I was noticing though, is like I had this major meltdown learning to drive a boat, major meltdown at work when I was in the corporate world, you know, the first time around, major meltdown here learning this cave diving piece. And I was like, all right, this is affecting my quality of life in a huge way because I don't know how to turn off the yaya in my mind. I don't know how to just fail forward. I don't know how to just be happy in this world. There's something wrong with me. So here's the thing about these work-life balance strategies, right? So it's great if we find strategies to more effectively use our time. I'm all for that. But what we're not doing is understanding two things. Is one is we're not understanding that we are humans made up of biological and psychological needs. And if we ignore those needs, it does not matter how many toaster ovens, nannies, or time management apps we have, we are going to feel unfulfilled and, and, and that we are not making a mark in the world and feel dissatisfied. Two, if we have a script, like I did when I'm explaining to you about this journey here, that says you are not important unless you're good at what you do. And we have this, this esteem need, which is one of our um, psychological needs that's going unmet in an ineffect or is being met in a very ineffective way then you're going to feel miserable no matter what. You're going to get um, upset when someone criticizes you. You're going to um, go home and gnash your teeth all night long when your boss looks at you, cross, you know, crossways or, or makes a remark that you somehow interpret as a criticism. And so this is what I was learning in this process as my husband and I took this you know, huge leap and went into the island world thinking, oh, that's gonna be so much better. It was an amazing adventure. And there was a lot of goodness that came out of it but a lot of it was a learning process of me going, wow, maybe what needs to change in this process is me. 
Um, then we moved on to Florida to this cave diving world, same thing. And I was seeing it not only in myself, but then these other really powerful women who were coming in to become, you know, badass cave divers now, just like I was. And we were just miserable in the process. Just the process of becoming a cave diver was making us miserable. They were shaking. They were crying. They were refusing to get back in the water like this intense shutdown psychologically. And so I started thinking like, okay, huh. <laughs> I've given up a lot to figure out this work-life balance thing. You know, A, I gave up uh, my executive salary, um, which that was painful, right? So now I'm living the simple life of being a dive bum and uh, living in, you know, environment that now I'm worried about my, my security needs. Like, how am I going to like pay my bills? That's not fun. And I'm still not having fun because I'm going off to be this dive bum and I'm not enjoying it. I'm just as miserable here as I was there. Now, again, in both of these worlds I'm describing, I don't mean miserable like every single day I was morose and depressed and just like totally flat out. It just was, hey, I'm happy for a minute. Oh, it was fleeting and there it goes again. And then, okay, oh, I'm happy again and there it goes again, okay? So this experience of mine took me on this very stark journey to say, wow, here I am, corporate success, got the house, got the paycheck, got the title, got the recognition at work, all the stuff that I thought I was supposed to strive for that was going to make me successful and I wasn't happy. Okay. I gave all that up and came over here to the simple life of being a dive bomb where I don't have as much money, but I have more freedom and time. I'm doing something that's supposed to be, you know, really like fun and enjoyable and my passion, blah, blah, blah. And I'm still curled up in the fetal position at night, crying myself to sleep. What gives? What gives? And now I would love to say that the light bulb came overnight. It didn't. Um, it took, you know, years of sort of really learning about human psychology and biology and studying that. My husband being a philosopher, which was phenomenal in our journey and helping us understand, like, why are we here on earth and answering some of those questions, like, what is it all for? And what we started realizing was that the only thing we really needed to change in this whole equation was not time management. It wasn't being more effective at work. It wasn't creating better boundaries. It wasn't learning to talk to your boss differently. Um, it wasn't going to get a job at a culture that was more family friendly. It wasn't any of that stuff that is that can be helpful. I'm not saying it can't be helpful, but it's not going to be like transformational. Okay, that's the, the key word. It wasn't going to live on an island where life could be simpler, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it was inside of us. And once we discovered the power of understanding how we are wired as humans, and then the rewiring that needed to take place in terms of the psychology we'd grown up with and how we were protecting ourselves by constantly deploying strategies that while they seemed like they were really big changes, I mean, certainly no one would argue that moving from uh, you know, the corporate world to an island is a pretty big change, right? There's a lot of risk involved, looks pretty, pretty ballsy. But all I was doing was saying, okay, well, instead of trying to be really good over here, I'll just try to be really good over here. Do you guys see that? Like nothing had changed because my view of the world hadn't changed. It wasn't, hey, let me go have this amazing experience and just see how it works and, 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 and just enjoy it for this experience and learn from it. It was, okay, I'm defining myself as important as a corporate exec and I have achieved in that world. It did make me happy. Now I'm gonna go achieve as a dive bum. I'm gonna be a dive bum. That's how I'm gonna define myself now. And when being a dive bum wasn't like super fulfilling every single second of the day and it was scary and it came with failure and it came with all these other pieces, the same stresses that I had in the corporate world, it was like, oh my God, now what do I do? <laughs> like I've been on both ends of the spectrum, but what hadn't changed was me, okay? My view of the world had not changed. So I say that because one of the things that is holding us hostage in our careers and in this work-life balance conundrum is our view of the world. Now, before I even share this with you, <clears throat> get ready because your defensiveness is going to pop up. Well, Kate, you don't know my boss. Kate, you don't know my environment. Kate, you don't know my, um, you know, I work for one of the top four. Kate, you don't know. Got it. Okay. Get ready. Defensiveness, come on, bring it because that is you protecting yourself. It has nothing to do with where you work. It has nothing to do with your boss. It has nothing to do with any of this. It has to do with this viewpoint, this achiever viewpoint we have in our society that says you are only valuable for what you do. 
So if you are not working a certain number of hours, if you are not involved in every single project, if you are not the person putting your signature on everything that comes out of your office, if you're not the person that is involved in everything, if you are not the person that your boss calls on, if you are not the most important person in the room, you are not valuable. Okay, and that has been given to us through our cultural training, through how we've been raised. Um, it could have come from parents, it could have come from a school, it just comes from what we see in magazines and TV, okay, which is you're important for what you do, not for who you are. Okay, and then you're like, well, okay, what does that have to do with work life balance? Well, what this has to do with work life balance is what is it that you're ultimately looking for, right? We always ask women, like clients that we work with before they enroll with us, we said, look, you got to find a word, like, why are you doing this? And usually the words come up are peace, freedom, calm, fulfillment, joy. Okay, those are the words that people will typically tell us. They don't say um, better strategist, more efficient, better, um, better multitasker. Nobody comes in and says, this is what I want. It's like, I want joy. I want freedom. I want control. I want peace. So that's the reason you're looking for work-life balance is because that's how you want to describe your life. And that's how you want to look back on your life in, you know, 20, 40, 60, 80 years, whatever. Then what you have to be looking at is an internal journey. Okay. Now the internal journey has to be what defines me is who I am. So how that plays out in the corporate world and in your job is you can walk into a room very quickly and instead of saying, we just had this conversation on our client call today, instead of saying, okay, what's everyone thinking about me? What do people think about me? Should I go talk to that person? Should I not? How's this presentation going to sound? What if I mess up? We walk into so many situations focused on ourself because it's self-protection. Okay. It's I got to be, I got to show up. I got to be really valuable. I have to be an A player. I've got to bring my A game. Versus I'm an A player and I can show up and I'm going to be just fine. But I wonder what that guy over there is all about. Let me go meet him. I wonder what my audience cares about most. Let me make sure that I figure that out so I can do my best to play to that. It changes the way you show up and work when you rewire yourself internally. So for me, had I gone to the islands with a different wiring with a I'm valuable for who I am versus what I do, it would have been like, oh my God, this dive boat thing is kind of trickier than I thought it was. All right, well, I'm going to show up again and try today. And I hope today I don't hit something. Whoops, I did. Didn't scratch the boat too bad. But I wouldn't go home and fester about it. I would just say like, okay, well, what do I need to do to not run into something tomorrow? <laughs> it just would have been a very like, huh, I thought of a couple of ideas. Great. Okay, honey, let's go have dinner. Okay, honey, let's go do the horizontal mambo. I'm cool. Instead of coming home, hanging your head, you know, snapping at your children, pushing your family away, pushing your health away, like, oh God, there's no way I can get on the treadmill now. I got to figure out how to drive a dive boat tomorrow, you know? So what we do is we are continually imploding ourselves and our own joy in life because we are spending so much time protecting ourselves in this value equation. And once my husband and I realized that this was such a huge boulder, I mean, just a brick wall in front of our happiness in life, because God knows we try to go over it and under it and around it and everything else. It was just like, wow, now I can just chip away at it and take the bricks out and start actually making progress in my life. So now when I go into work, I'm not worried about making a mistake. If I make a mistake, I make a mistake and I'm going to own it and talk about it and do whatever I need to correct it. But I'm not spending all this energy in fear. I'm more focused on everyone else around me and making sure that they are feeling comfortable, that they are feeling supported, that they have what they need. Not that I'm sacrificing my needs for them. Let me just put a little placeholder there because we do work with some women who we call nurturers who are so busy taking care of everyone else. They don't take care of themselves. But what I'm saying is psychologically, I'm not walking in the room totally focused on myself. Does that make sense? And so what this allows you to do is obviously um, rescope workload, rescope projects, show up and say, I've got a different solution. I hear you, Mr. Leader, but I have a different solution because you're no longer scared of what someone else is going to think of you if you show up that way. And it doesn't mean that you win every battle, right? It's all about the long game, which is, hey, you know, sometimes I'm going to work more, sometimes I'm going to work less, sometimes I'm going to mom more, sometimes I'm going to mom less, sometimes I'm going to wife more, sometimes I'm going to wife less. Like I am not... We use this word work-life balance just because it's uh, 
you know, popular. It's what we all talk about is life balance, but it's never balance. It's never, you know, it's, it's flow. It's, you know, there's times I'm working 70 hours a week and I'm giving my kids as much love as I can give them. I'm giving my husband as much love as I can give them. Hopefully the dog's getting fed in there somewhere and that's just what it is, but it's, it's a choice. It's creative. It's what I need to do right now. And I am steeped in the knowledge and confident that that 70 hour work week I'm putting in right now is absolutely what I need to be doing to meet my human needs. But I'm also certain that if I continue to do that week after week after week after week after week, and I'm ignoring my needs, and I'm not understanding how to keep myself in an optimal state um, of human performance, okay, this is your needs, then I will burn out. I will yell at my children. I will take it out on my husband. I will take it out on my team. And I will become scorched earth to everyone around me because I have allowed that to happen. So this is what is such a game changer when you start to understand the science of human behavior is you can start controlling it and using it and leveraging it to your advantage. And not only does this change how you show up in your career, it changes how you show up in your personal life. I mean, just imagine the energy you would have if you came home every day, not having spent the last eight to 10 hours stressing about your work. You went in, you did your work, you had difficult conversations, you accepted challenges, you made decisions, and you didn't second guess them. You weren't constantly worried about them. You weren't thinking about what everyone thinks about you. You weren't, you were okay with saying, oh, you know what? I'm gonna let Sue have that, that project. It's big, it's prestigious, it's amazing. Right now though, that's not something I'm gonna be able to do. Ask me for the next one, boom. Wow, you're just like managing and navigating your environment without all the hoopla that's going on up here in your psychology, it's like, it's like add like five hours of energy to your day, right? Like right there. You're going to come home with more willpower, more energy, more confidence and grace. It's a complete game changer, complete game changer. And so again, what we see over and over again, and please understand this was given to you. Like, this, you know, don't beat yourself up for behaving in this way. This was given to you in our culture, right? But now that you know it, it, the onus is on you to create the changes, which is I can no longer operate from a base of fear. I can no longer operate from pushing tomorrow down the road um, and hoping that joy is still going to be there when I get there. I've got to start balancing out my needs. I've got to start self-care. I've got to get rid of the cray-cray upstairs. And I've got to start showing up with grace, with power in all areas of my life without constantly feeling like I am going to be more valuable for what I do versus who I am. Okay. Now, how you apply that really quick before we sign off into the workplace is you start recognizing that when you show up shortly after this journey, I just told you about like the sort of, that was took years, but when I went from corporate world to Island to, um, to cave diving. So then I went back into the corporate world, boom, boom, boom. And as I went back in the corporate world, it was like, it was like a game changer because instead of me going like, how do I prove myself? How do I be Wonder Woman? How do I get the promotion? How do I, um, you know, make sure everybody knows that I'm worth it. I knew I was worth it because they hired me. That's it, right? Like I'm already here. That is it. There's no proving. Now I'm going to just come in and do the job, but I'm going to do it highly effectively because I'm no longer have fear attached to it. And it allows you to go into that workplace environment now and say, okay, I see you guys have always done it that way. Here's a new way. I think we need to think about this. Huh, that's interesting that you're having that reaction to that. I see that this is a very important subject to you. Let's talk about it. Why is that so important to you? And I'm having this conversation with my boss, right? Not like, oh my God, he just told me that I dropped the ball and he just told me this and I'm going to go home and like, what did he mean by dropping the ball? I got to figure that out. Does it, does he mean I need to do the project harder, better, faster, greener, redder? <laughs> but when I think of how much time in my career I spent second guessing others' emotions, it's exhausting. Now I just ask, oh, I'm curious. Why'd you say that? Can you tell me more about that? Or do you have a concern or what do we need to talk about? Because I am now not worried about how I show up. I know I show up with value. The value is who I am, not what I do. Okay. So I hope that really helps you guys and, and maybe write that down. The value is who you are, not in what you do. It is a deep um, psychological process to unwind that, but you, that is the beginning to true freedom. You know, for those of you who want true freedom, true control, where you can just walk through life and just feel like whatever it is, I can own it and handle it. And it's easy. And it does not have to affect the quality of my life. I have control over that. That's what it takes.
Okay, that right there. So for any of you out there who are listening, if you're an executive woman, a high achieving woman, a woman with a highly successful career, and you are struggling because work is always overpowering your personal life, and you know you're not showing up in your personal life at your best, and you want to you know, solve that once and for all, I encourage you to book a call. Please book a call with us so we can talk about what's possible for you and help you sort that out and get a game plan. All right, guys, thank you so much for showing up for this broadcast. Feel free to share, feel free to tag, feel free to put something in the comments. We can always come back and answer your questions at any time, whether you've watched it live or you watch it later under recording. And uh, it's been great speaking with you.